As the eighth and final theme of this course, uh, we will now dive into the topic of structural change of the industry. And particularly, we are interested in the impacts of uh, entry of new, new firms and exit of firms from the market. So, thus far, we have, I have mentioned that uh, the traditional view of uh, productivity growth uh, has been that uh, it's almost a synonym to technical progress. So, uh, if you think about this uh, solo model that we briefly discussed, uh, so in the solo cell framework, this uh, technical progress or, or productivity growth was this kind of uh, function A that shifts the production function over time. So, that's similar to this uh, technical change component of the, of the Malmquist index. So, since the 1980s, then, these uh, studies on Malmquist index decomposition, they started to recognize also that uh, efficiency improvement uh, can be another significant source of productivity growth. Uh, of course, this kind of um, efficiency improvement doesn't concern the leading firms or leading countries that are operating on the frontier, but it applies to the uh, inefficient firms or inefficient countries that can cap catch up uh, the, the, the technology frontier of the, of the industry or the world. Um, in, uh, in the 1990s, then, uh, uh, in the literature of industrial organization, there emerged another uh, source of productivity growth that uh, we can roughly uh, categorize as structural change of the industry. And uh, it's interesting to note that this uh, uh, literature on structural change has, uh, has uh, developed almost completely independently from this uh, Malmquist index uh, literature. And uh, there are some, some reasons uh, for that is that uh, in the Malmquist index, of course, this uh, efficiency change or catching up the frontier, that of course occurs at the level of the individual firm or individual country. Uh, whereas uh, by construction, the, the structural change is a phenomenon at more aggregate level of an industry or, or, the, or the country. So it's more like how resources are allocated uh, across firms and, and particularly there's issues like entry of new firms and uh, exit of, uh, of, uh, of uh, dying firms in some sense are, are very relevant. So I have mentioned here a couple of studies and I will, I will then uh, go into a little bit more details on those starting from this uh, very influential paper by Olli and Pakes in 1996 in Econometrica. So, um, there are several contributions of this uh, Olian Pakes paper. So, that's really a thick paper in some sense that there is a lot of, uh, lot of new insights. So, uh, the, the authors start with the empirical case of the deregulation of telecommunications industry in the USA. And they, they point out that uh, this uh, deregulation then brought uh, uh, lots of new firms to this uh, industry. And uh, one interesting observation they make uh, uh, empirically also, is that if they compare the balanced panel of firms and then, then the full sample of firm, including this uh, new entrance, then the productivity growth rates are rather different, uh, and particularly in the, in the later years after the, after the deregulation. And uh, this is actually an interesting connection to the uh, topics that we have covered so far. So if you think about the Malmquist index or Fisher index or or, um, or these other, other kind of index number approaches. So typically in these um, uh, firm level studies of, uh, of using Malmquist index, for example, uh, you would always consider a balanced panel. So if there are some firms that you did not uh, observe throughout the entire uh, time span of the study, then typically researcher would leave out those, uh, those new firms or exiting firms from the sample and focus on the on the balanced panel of those firms that survive throughout this entire study period. So, yeah, this is the, the meaning of the balanced versus unbalanced panel on this slide. So, panel, balanced panel would only consider the firms that survive throughout the entire time period of the study, whereas unbalanced panel would also consider uh, those firms that uh, entered the industry during this time period or left out of this uh, sample for whatever for whatever reason. So, and, and, uh, and it is interesting to note that this uh, can make a big difference. So, so in this particular case, Oli and Pakes argue that uh, the use of the balance panel tends to have an upward bias to the productivity estimates. 
So therefore, this, this then uh, observation motivates them to uh, propose a following kind of decomposition of the industry level productivity. So this is something completely different from this uh, uh, decompositions of the Malmquist index or the Fisher index that we considered in the previous theme. So this, this uh, decomposition breaks down the, the industry level productivity in this case to the, to the components uh, or two components at that, that we will see. And actually this uh, decomposition is only a small part of this uh, rather thick paper. So I have here just uh, uh, reproduced this uh, description of the decomposition. It's just a couple of, uh, couple of lines in some sense. So this is in the, in the original words of Olian Pakis. So firstly about the notation. So they, they denote the industry level productivity by just this lowercase p in period t. And uh, I want to note that it's, uh, it's the level of productivity. So you can think about it as a productivity index, for example. So it's a measure of the productivity level, not the change, but level. And uh, they decompose the, the industry productivity or they state the industry productivity as the weighted sum of the firm level productivity. So this uh, P subscript I T refers to the productivity of firm I in period T. And they, they uh, take this industry productivity as the weighted sum of the firm level productivity. So this uh, S indicates then the uh, share weights of, of the firm's uh, uh, output in period T. So, so now actually they, they consider plant level data. So it's actually I is not a firm, but plant. But any, anyway, whatever units we have there are, are indicated by subscript I. So then in equation 16 or equations 16, then uh, Oli and Pakistan break down this industry level uh, industry level productivity index to, to different components and they show that uh, we, can, we can rewrite this uh, first expression as a sum of two components. So the first is this P upper bar. P upper bar is just the uh, unweighted average productivity uh, of the firms in period T. So that's the average productivity of the firms. And then there's another component that depends on these uh, shares S and, and P. So although this, there is this symbol delta that uh, usually refers to the, uh, for example, change over time, but here it's actually difference to the mean. So there's not any, anything about productivity change over time, but this is just difference of the uh, firm I share compared to the average share and also the productivity level of firm I relative to the average productivity. So this delta symbol should not be confused as some, some kind of change over time. It's, it's a difference to the mean. Uh, in any case, this, um, this uh, second component then can be interpreted as a, as a reallocation effect. So I have, I have uh, written it down here separately. And in fact, it also relates to the covariance of the, of the shares and, uh, and the these, um, uh, level of productivity. So intuitively on this slide, I have written down this in the red color so that we can break down the industry productivity as a sum of two components that reflect the average firm level productivity. And then there's a reallocation term. So this, in a sense, this reallocation term uh, then captures this uh, impact that are the resources allocated efficiently to most productive firms or not. And we can, of course, also monitor that how this reallocation term develops over time, but I have emphasized uh, already several times that uh, this decomposition is stated uh, in terms of the level of productivity. And on the top, I, I actually have here this uh, uh, also copied that how, how Oli and Pakis define this uh, firm level productivity PIT. So in some sense, it, if you think about this expression in parentheses, it's just the regression residual. So they, they have the Cobb-Douglas production function that they that they estimate. So this Y and L and K are stated in logarithms, but um, then this, uh, uh, when they take this uh, exponential function, so, so that then captures in some sense the different or, or the ratio of the actual observed output and the potential output. 
So, so that's in, expressed in terms of levels and not in terms of logs. I come back to that why this is uh, this is important point to keep in mind. So even though this um, a narrative of Oli and Pakes uh, emphasized this entry of new firms and this kind of impacts of entry and exit uh, to the structural change of the of the industry, um, the um, decomposition actually does not make any many any distinction between reallocation of resources across existing firms and uh, the possible contribution of entry and exit. So that has been considered one of the limitations of this uh, Oli and Pake's uh, decomposition. Another thing I want to point out that uh, besides this uh, decomposition, so this decomposition is actually just one small part of this, uh, this paper. Uh, one important part of the paper is also that uh, they um, propose an uh, a novel way to estimate the production function, which uh, which is subject to the endogeneity problem, or specifically the simultaneity problem, and they they propose to use a, a rather original way. It's not really instrumental variable uh, technique. Uh, so they they utilize the the investment data to try to overcome this endogeneity problem, and uh, this is something that falls beyond the core beyond the scope of the present course. However, I want to mention that um, this uh, decomposition uh, presented here that is completely separate from this uh, estimation of the of the productivity indices. So, so uh, it seems that uh, many people have the impression that you have to follow the estimation strategy of Olean Pax to to implement this decomposition. However, I, I see no reason why this uh, why this uh, decomposition of industry productivity couldn't be used uh, whatever way the productivity is measured, whether it is some uh, index numbers or, or, or a Monquist uh, index or whatever. So I believe that uh, this, uh, this uh, decomposition of the industry productivity applies to any, any method of estimating this, uh, this productivity indices. So I mentioned also a couple of other studies that, uh, that looked at this entry and exit uh, uh, in the in the industrial organization literature, and one is this uh, early paper by Bailey, Halton, and Campbell in uh, 1992. I believe that this came out actually as some kind of book chapter. So initially, it was not really really influential, but over time, this contribution has been has been recognized. So, uh, in contrast to Oli and Pakes, this this study uh, distinguishes explicitly the impacts of entry and exit. So they classify the, uh, the, the data to three, three exclusive subgroups of uh, survivors indicated by S. Then there's group of entrants that is called, labeled E. And then there's this exiting firms, which is, uh, which is labeled with, uh, with X. And uh, they, they use this grouping then to decompose the uh, productivity change or productivity growth. So notice that in contrast to Oli and Pakes, who operated in terms of the level of productivity, uh, this decomposition works actually for the, for the percentage change of productivity. And on the bottom part of the slide, I have, uh, I have briefly explained why we can interpret this as a percentage change, because if we take this, um, so firstly, this um, uh, capital phi indicates the industry level uh, productivity, which is expressed in terms of logarithms. So this delta phi is, is a difference in, in this uh, industry level uh, log productivity in period T and period T minus one. And uh, there is this, uh, this rule that, uh, that this uh, log, log difference is approximately equal to the, to the percentage change, as I have explained down in the bottom part of the, of the slide. So we can think about this as a decomposition of the percentage change. And for, for then this uh, lowercase phi then uh, is, is also similarly the, the log productivity of uh, firm I or plant I, whatever, in periods, in two periods. So here these periods, uh, uh, we consider two periods, one and two. So period one is the base period and period two is the target period. So 
there are two two ways to break down this uh, this uh, productivity change. Uh, one is this um, in the first line we have first this for the surviving firms S. Uh, there is the S S indicates lowercase S indicates the share of the uh, again the share of this uh, surviving firms uh, or share of firm I uh, in period two multiplied by the the log of productivity and and we compare that uh, that uh, share weighted uh, uh, or or share of uh, of firm, firm i and its its product log productivity minus share in in of i in period 1 and its log productivity so this first sum captures the uh, productivity change of the of the surviving firms and then we have these two other components uh, so notice that on, on below this uh, sigma operator you can see this uh, this group uh, that we are considering so this in the second uh, there is this group e of uh, entering firms and third component has this label x for the for the exiting firms and um, obviously in this uh, base period uh, base period one we do not observe these new firms that enter only in in period two and in contrast, these exiting firms are observed in period one, but not in period two. So that's partly the challenge in all of this, uh, these uh, decompositions with entry and exit. So in some sense, this uh, decomposition by Bailey et al., uh, it looks as uh, this uh, productivity change of the surviving firms. And then there is, in some sense, the net effect of the, of the entering firms minus the, the exiting firms. And, and there is also, also, as the second line indicates, it's also possible to break down this effect in, in different ways. So in the second line, uh, notice that there is the first two sums are for the surviving firms. So the, in the second line, this uh, first component of surviving firms uh, is looking at this uh, productivity change of the surviving firms uh, using the share weights of period one. And then the second, for, second uh, sum uh, considers again the surviving firms, but now it looks at the at the at the uh, change in the shares of the surviving firms uh, uh, multiplied by the uh, log productivity in period two, and then we have these contributions of entering firms and exiting firms. So this already illustrates that it's possible to uh, break down this uh, industry productivity to these components of survivors and entrants and exiters. In many different ways so there's not really any unique uh, right or wrong decomposition and subsequently in the in the literature of industrial organization there has been several other decompositions proposed so i have taken this uh, this table from the from the relatively recent paper by melitz and polanek in rand journal of economics and uh, there is uh, three other decompositions considered uh, uh, there is uh, GR, which refers to Grilichesh and Rejev uh, decomposition. FHK uh, refers to Foster, Haltivang and Kreisen. And then there is this label DOPD. So that's the development of, uh, of Melitz and Polanek themselves. That refers to dynamic Olipakes uh, decomposition. So the main challenge in this decomposition is, like I briefly mentioned before, is that uh, these new firms, we do not observe them in period one, and the exiting firms, we do not observe them in the in the target period two. So how do we how do we then break down these components of entering and exiting firms? So the solution of uh, Grilichers and Rejev uh, that they propose is to then consider the average productivity of of periods one and two. So that is this uh, a capital phi upper bar that they use in their their decomposition. Uh, Foster et al. have a slightly different proposal, and then uh, uh, this uh, DOPD, so this uh, Melitz and Polanek proposal, then considers the considers this uh, uh, surviving firms as a benchmark. So they they propose to decompose this uh, uh, impacts of entering firms and exiting firms relative to the productivity level of the surviving firms in the same period. So in that sense, this uh, this Melitz and Polanek uh, is perhaps the most intuitive uh, way of, of breaking it down. But as I said, there's not any 
any right or wrong way of, of, of decomposing. The question is more like, uh, like uh, which one is most uh, intuitively appealing and, uh, and uh, when, we, when we are appealing to the intuition, then, then it's kind of uh, uh, just the sub subjective beauty that is on the eye of the beholder. So these decompositions then look at these uh, shear weights and uh, and um, and try to try to look at the entry and exit. So of course there has been then a lot of uh, subsequent papers that try to combine these uh, ideas of Oli and Pakes with those uh, decompositions with entry and exit. And uh, on this slide I note that uh, this has been a particularly active topic here in Finland that there's been particularly Mika Maliranta and uh, his co-authors have been uh, particularly active in this area, trying to reconcile these uh, uh, views of Oli and Pakes with the, with the entry and exit. And uh, the latest paper of, uh, of Maliranta and Mäthänen in 2015, uh, they, for example, then uh, apply this uh, Oli and Pakes decomposition separately for each of these groups uh, uh, of survivors and entrance and exiting firms. So that's obviously one, one possibility. And they operate that in the, entirely in the static setting. So they do it for the, for the levels of productivity. And I believe that is also a correct strategy because as, as I mentioned many times before, uh, this Oli and Pakes uh, decomposition really applies to the, to the levels of productivity rather than change. So, but let's let's look at this uh, latest proposition by Melitz and Polanek in a little bit more detail. So, I, I had it in the in the um, in this table already before. So, there, if we, if we phrase it this way, uh, it would be correct to state this as the as the difference of the of the productivity in period t and t minus one. So, this capital P is now the level of productivity of the industry. So, we can use this. Um, formula by Melitz and Polanek this way to, to uh, state the difference in the, in the level of productivity from period T to T minus one to T and break it down to the components of the survivors and, uh, and entrance and exiting firms. So as the first component on the right hand side of the equation, notice that we have then there this, um, this uh, P upper bar that refers to the average productivity of the surviving firms. So the first component then indicates that how much the average productivity level changes for, for the surviving firms from period T minus one to T. The second component in this uh, square brackets involving these covariances of, uh, of S and P. So that's the covariances of the shares S and uh, productivities P. And this is all, all for the surviving firms. So this covariance component and the difference of these covariance components then, then uh, indicates the, the change in the reallocation component. So uh, this, in, this expression in the brackets then essentially measures that uh, is the allocation of resources improving over time. So do the, do the highly productive firms get more resources and, and less productive firms lose resources? So this covariance term is, is really this um, part of the Oli Pakes uh, decomposition. So basically this first line, uh, this uh, average productivities and this covariance terms is just this, uh, uh, this Oli and Pakes components of the, of the average productivity of the surviving firms and the reallocation term of the Oli Pakes decomposition applied to the surviving firms. And then this, uh, idea of Melitz and Polanek is to combine it with this, uh, these uh, entry and exit components. So they essentially compare the impact of entry by comparing this group of entrants, the productivity in the group of entrants to the, to the productivity of the surviving firms. And that is in the period T where we observe this entrance. And the contribution of exiting firms, on the other hand, we consider that and in the period uh, T minus one only, because we only observe this exiting firms in period T minus one. So we compare the productivity of exiting firms uh, uh, to the productivity of the surviving firms at, at the same time period T minus one. So in, in my view, this is, this is an appealing feature of the Merlitz and Polanek decomposition that, uh, 
that these components of entry and exit have very natural interpretation because it's the, the relative productivity of the entering firms relative to the survivors in the same period. And also we compare the exiting firms relative to the survivors in the, in the same time period. So notice that this uh, component of entry is measured at time period T, whereas this component of exit is measured in time period T minus one. So we do not observe those uh, group E and group X X in the in the same time period ever. And that's why we need to compare it to the to the group of surviving firms that we observe in both periods. So from the outset, uh, this uh, proposal by Melitz and Polanet looks like a very natural way of uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, looking at this components of entry and exit, and also the possibility to reallocate resources between uh, surviving firms. However, if you look at this uh, paper a little bit more carefully, there is actually rather elementary error in the, their interpretation. So I have already emphasized a lot that uh, this oil and package decomposition was stated in terms of the level of productivity, not in terms of logs. However, Molitz and, Melitz and Polanek uh, assume that, uh, that uh, it was stated in logs so that they could interpret this uh, these uh, differences, so these log differences would be percentage changes. However, if, if this P, uh, lowercase p and upper, uppercase p are not in logs but in levels, then this percentage change uh, interpretation is no longer valid. And um, this is also not very easy to fix because if we, if we would then divide both sides of the equation by uh, capital P, so the industry productivity in period T minus one. So the left hand side would be percentage change, but then uh, we cannot really, uh, we would need to have a common scaling factor for all of these components on the right hand side. So we cannot take, for example, uh, percentage change in the average productivity of the surviving firms. So these four components, we cannot uh, separately uh, calculate them as percentages and add up, but, but we would need to have a, have a common scaling factor, like uh, Melitz and Polanek actually recognized that in the appendix, but, uh, but not in the main part of the paper. So uh, to repeat this, this way of breaking down the uh, productivity change is, is correct for the, for the difference of the productivity indices, but at least directly we cannot interpret as a percentage change of productivity. And also if we try to then uh, measure the percentage changes in those comp individual components, then this uh, aggregation to industry level breaks up. So, so this, this is, in my view, a uh, um, quite fundamental defect in this, uh, this uh, decomposition of Melitz and Polanek. So in my view, this uh, appropriate way of combining Oli and Pakes with entry and exit is still, uh, to some extent, an open question. There has been some attempt in the, in the relatively recent literature, but, uh, but so far not, not entirely satisfactory proposal. So in the next topic, then I will look into a little bit more in detail to the shear weights S. So far, I have been quite uh, silent about those. And then I'll propose uh, what is, in my, my view, a better decomposition that uh, in includes this entry and exit and reallocation component.